what you will learn in this course. So mainly it's based on the internet. So we will understand exactly how the internet is working, how it is working and why is it working the way it does because we will see that there's limitations. Okay, so we made some design choices uh, that actually make it work fine even though there are some adjustments that have been done in the last years. Uh, and that's what I'm going to present. So it will mainly be about explaining protocols. So we'll see that there's a bunch of protocols. So whenever you have something ending with a P, like IP, TCP, those are because we, are, we will uh, study protocols. But as well, some uh, more general concepts to computer science, such as resource allocations. Applications as well, because we're going to start by 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 uh, by teaching those. I mean, we take a top-down approach, so we start by whatever as a user you have access to, and different type of networks, including wired networks or wireless networks. So we will see that there are some key concepts that will be used in in multiple uh, locations of a network. So naming, layering, caching, and so on. Okay. And as a skill, you will learn to program because the project will be about designing a network program, configuring. So that's why we need NetKit and as well understanding the protocol with Wireshark. So those are the skills you're going to acquire. Okay. So that's it. So if you don't have, do you have any questions regarding the syllabus or should we start the, uh, the lecture? We are uh, late. No, we don't late. We're not late. I was, it was 15 minutes. Any questions or should I start the, the, the first lecture? It's good? Good for everybody? So if you if you are really okay, yeah, using the reactions like a, a thumb or whatever reaction to let me know that I should carry on, it's it's much easier. And okay, thank you so much, guys. Thank you. All right, so let's start with the introduction. So I, I will go over like a general view of what is a network and understand what it means studying networking. Okay, because maybe it doesn't seem so obvious, but uh, basically we will try to, uh, to understand this. So what is a computer network, right? What is it exactly and who is it for? I mean, why do we need one and, and so on? So first of all, these kind of networks connect machines, which is pretty obvious. So here on the picture, I represented like laptops, uh, smartphones, servers, clients, and so on. And what do we mean by a machine? The machine is a computing device. So it means that it needs to have CPU, memory, and a network card, which can be either Wi-Fi, 4G, or uh, Ethernet if it's with a wire. Okay. So there's plenty uh, of uh, those kind of devices. And lately, anything that is any device that comes electrified is now have access to a network to the internet. Okay. So it's not anymore about providing power with CPU, but as well now. Even a rice cooker have access to the internet. Okay, so as you may see, so those devices are there are plenty of them, and that's the reason now we, we talk about the internet of everything. Okay, anything that is electrified should have access to the internet. So those devices are used by users. Okay, and what the users want, they want to access some remote resources. So those may be content such as web pages, pictures, videos, or whatever you name it or some services, like on the cloud, I want to be able to store some files uh, on, on, on Google Drive or whatever. So those are hosting services, providing storage, or could be as well processing. If I have a task uh, to complete, I may submit it to a server and it will process the data that I need and then download uh, the, uh, the, 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 the result of this process. Okay, so either it's content or services so once again so we have those computers so they want to access so what they're going to do they're going to basically carry the data on behalf of the user so whenever you need to download the data somebody need to bring the data the bytes to your computer that will be through uh, a network with wires and uh, and so on um, so here the thing to be able to access those services or those content as a user, you need to download the software, all right? either your browser, if you want to download a web page, uh, or either a player uh, for Netflix. So all of this, what you need to understand is in the internet, things have been des designed such as, as a user, you are free 
to download any kind of software that you want, any kind of application. And those applications will be basically your interface with the network, given that this is where you're going to send a request in order to download or to access the service. Okay? And there's very little things that can be done in the internet right now to be able to control what are the applications that a user can use. Right? You are free to use any application. Of course, operators may put some restrictions okay, in order for some application, but you can see applications such as BigTorrent is really hard to control. I mean, to block those kind of application is really hard. And that's one of the success of the, of, the, of the internet. So anybody can design a new application and any user can download and start using the application. And that freedom, that's what actually allowed the internet to innovate so much through new applications that users really like using and make the internet so successful. All right, so there's really a little of control that can be done given that most of the computers come with an open interface that anyone can use to develop a new application. All right, so I talked about data, okay? So as I said, computers run application, a software, and in our case, those are networking application, meaning that at least you need two software, one running on your client and another one on the server, for instance. So, and those two applications running, okay, those two pieces of software, this is because of running that one of the endpoints going to produce some data and the other one going to consume the data. So somehow you need to carry the data from whatever, wherever they are produced to whoever is using the data. So those applications, there are two main um, models for those. We have either the client server, where as a, as, a, as a client, you don't have much to offer. The only thing that you do is you contact the server, such as, as a web server, in order to download some content. Or you may use a peer-to-peer -peer application. And in that case, means that you are connected to another device, which is a peer. It doesn't have any different software. It's exactly the same software running. And you can either be a client, because you want to download the MP3 file shared by this client, or you may offer them a file that you, you may want to share, all right? So two pieces of software designed, okay? Two main models, client server, peer-to-peer -peer server, the application. BitTorrent, for instance, is an example of peer-to-peer -peer application. And we're gonna have a chapter regarding those uh, applications, okay? Given that the initial traditional application that, uh, that was available was a client server. So what do we mean by actually sending some data? So as any carrier, what you need to do is to prepare the goods that you want to send. So that's why on the, on the right here, I show you that whenever you want to use the post office services, you need to use an envelope or you need to uh, use a box where you're going to put whatever you need to be sent. With the data, it's pretty much the same. So what it means, it means that on my side, I have a file and I need to send it. Before I can send it, I will first need to divide it in pieces, okay? And to each of those pieces, which is like bytes of data, I will add some extra information to it. So I'm gonna add what we call a header. And inside there, this is some bytes with a special meaning, the same way when you send a letter, you need to put an envelope with including, for instance, the address of the destination. So this is exactly the same that I'm going to do here. I need to divide in pieces, which we can call messages or packets. And on top of those pieces, I will add some extra information that will be needed by the network, such as each of those pieces reach the right destination. And on top of this, we're going to see that we need to add some extra properties. But as you may see, adding the header which means the envelope with the extra information that is needed, it's called the encapsulation. Once you receive the pieces on the size of the server, you need to reassemble those pieces together by removing the header, checking a few things. I mean, am I the destination, for instance? And then combine those pieces back in order to get the file. All right, and this is removing the header and reading the header, the data including the header. It's called the Decapulation, all right? So that's it. 
So small pieces, okay, add more data to a header and inside the header, you can find, and that's not the only information, but you can find, for instance, the address of the source and the address of the destination. Okay, those are the basic information. But there's a lot more information that I need to add. So just for, because maybe you have the question, so the size of the message is usually, a typical size is 1500 bytes, okay? Given that the headers may be, for instance, 60 bytes. All right, so we always want to minimize the size of the header, giving the whole size of the message. The same way when you send the package, you don't want the box to be heavier than the goods that you have inside the package. Otherwise, if they charge you by the, the weight of the package, right, you need to make sure that actually uh, you have a very small envelope or box. We do the same here with the header. So what are the properties that need to be achieved and the reason why we add the header? So the header, we have the addresses, so that's pretty obvious. But on top of the, the addresses, we may want to achieve a special property regarding the transfer. And what do I mean by that? We, we want our transfer to be reliable. So what does it mean by reliable? Given that networks are not reliable, you may have losses or you may have corrupted bits. So somehow you need to be able to recover, repair the losses or repair um, the, um, the bits that are in L, right? So somehow by adding a header, you need to be able to enable the fact that somehow I can check the losses and if there's a loss, I will correct those losses. So I will show later what kind of information you can add in a header just in order to make sure that the transfer is reliable. That would include, for instance, a sequence number. You're gonna put a number, packet one, two, three, four, five. If you receive packet one, two, and no packet three, it means that it's missing. So something needs to be done in order to recover the third packet. Right? So this is for the reliability. So you need to add a sequence number to make it reliable. It needs to be efficient, which means that here what we want, we want to send messages. The messages have a header, and you want to make sure that actually the size of the message, which the top, as I said, the maximal size could be 15 bytes, you, you really send 1500 bytes long messages and not smallest one. Otherwise, you're not efficient. So you want to, to send the maximal size available, okay? And you also want to control how many messages you send in the network because if you're sending too many messages per second, you may create congestion. So you want also to have a sending rate that is consistent with the capacity of your network. So that's what we call the efficiency here. Uh, it needs to be fair which means that anybody who have access to the network and try to send data should be able to send the same amount of data without having someone with a higher priority. Okay, so the internet is totally fair. It means that a user doesn't have a higher bandwidth or a higher capacity than any other. So it needs to be fair. So we also have here ways of making sure that when you have multiple sources, they can basically use the same um, uh, amount of capacity in the network. It needs to be scalable. So scalability is a very important thing for distributed system, including networks, which means that if you can measure your system through the use of a countable measure, which means, for instance, the number of nodes in your network, the number of messages you are sending, and so on, you need to be able to provide with any kind of mechanism here, which actually shouldn't be sensitive to, the, to this number. So it means that even if you increase the number of users, you want the system to still perform well. You don't want to downgrade the system because you are increasing the number of users. And this is very important because when you have millions of users or nodes in your network, you cannot say that, oh, I'm providing you here with the application, but oh, I can only handle 10 connections. You see, so you need always to design things with scalability in mind. So you don't want to basically downgrade the system because of too many users, too many messages, okay? As well, you may have time delivery. So it means that you want to make sure that the packets are received before a given deadline, which is really hard to, uh, uh, to guarantee, especially in the internet. And of course, the security. But guys, I'm sorry to uh, break it through to you, but internet have been designed with zero security in mind. 
So all the protocols that we're going to study together, everything regarding the internet have been designed without security. So that's why we need to do add-ons. So we touch the internet with extra services in order to guarantee some of those properties such as encryption, privacy, authentication, and so on. But in the first design of the internet, there were no security at all. Okay. All right, so as we said, so there's a data encapsulation and I'm sorry, I just talked about a header, one header, but the truth is actually, we're gonna add multiple headers. Only one is not enough. So which means that if on the left, I have here my data, it will go through a sequence of programs, process, that will basically add a new header. So which means that if I have one, two, three, four, at the end, as you may see, I have four headers, giving that the last program here will add also a trailer. Okay, so that's just the way it is. So you just add a bunch of bytes, and it's done at each of those processing here, okay, which we will see later, we're gonna call them layers. For now, I just represent them from left to right, and I go through a sequence of program, which means that one program gonna call the other, such as a function, and you pass the data to the other, who will add a header, who then call the next program in the sequence, add a new header, and so on. So that's the reason here you can see the colors, the blue, orange, green, and red header, giving that on top of the red header, you also have the trailer, okay? It's also interesting to see that whenever you go through those programs, you may not only add a header, but you may also store a state, which means that because you send this packet, you need to remember about the packet that you send. In that case, you will install in your memory a kind of a state, a variable, that will say that packet three sent. And you need to remember about sending this one, okay? So that's the reason we have states as well, okay? Um, so that's it. And at, at the final stage, so you go through your interface, which can be either Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. I'm sorry, I put an old one because otherwise nowadays you can even, even not tell what is a Wi-Fi card. So I put an old one with the antennas as it used to be 10 years ago, but that's supposed to be Wi-Fi. And this is Ethernet, so this is really classic. And at the end of this, I have the wire, and on the wire, I have a signal. So at the end, every bit gonna be transferred, gonna be transmitted as a signal, okay? That will propagate either in the air, if I'm using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, or on the wire uh, through a signal, okay? So, and the same gonna happen whenever I'm receiving this signal by, uh, at the destination. And as I said, so each, the same sequence in the reverse order, gonna basically remove any extra header or trailer that have been added. So you see that each of them, I remove header and trailer, I remove the header, header, header. And of course, removing the header means that I'm gonna look inside the data of the header, checking for things, okay? So I will show you many examples of what kind of information are available in the header and what is it gonna trigger at the receiver and why the source have added those information in the header, all right? And so what are gonna happen is like each of those pieces gonna be reassembled until the file is available and presented to the user through its browser, for instance, if you're using the web. Sorry, because I cannot see the last bullet. So this is what we call, okay, the de desencapsulation here, okay? I, I remove the header. All right, so just to give you an example of a header, right? Because we're talking about a header. So the header is nothing more like a label that is added by FedEx with a bunch of information, okay? Yes, you have the addresses here from to, but you have a bunch of other information that are useful for FedEx. Well, we do the same in uh, the internet. So here I give just an example of the header added by IP, which is one of the protocols. And in green here, I represented that header that I've been added, okay? And you can see there, that source IP address, destination IP address, but not only. There's a bunch of other information added here, okay? So we're gonna study those information to understand the reason of each of those information. So each field here have a specific value that will basically um, change the way you process the packet. So for instance, you have the TTL here. What does it mean for the TTL? You just limit the life of a packet 
because each time you go through a node in the network, you're going to decrement this value. If it reaches zero, you kill the packet. Okay. Otherwise, it will loop forever. So just a few examples to show you. Okay, so I'm sorry, it's, the, the, the fonts here are not really good. So the same way I was showing you that you go from left to right and from right to left, depending if you're the source or the destination, as you may see, it's not really handy to represent them in a sequence on the line. So instead of doing this, what we do in networks, we put them in layers. So still the message go through each of the sequence of program that we have, but we put them, we, we pile them up to make it easier for the representation purposes here, all right? So it still means that the message comes from above, from the bottom, and go through each of the programs until you reach uh, your, the, the wire, okay? So that's the reason each of the programs that I talked about, so if you go through the application, it will depend on the type of application you're using, okay? Either it's your browser, either it's WeChat, either it's Skype or whatever, so the data that you generate, so either is a picture, either is a text message, either is an audio file, those will go through multiple programs installed on your computer, okay? So what you need to understand is we have the application, so those are running at the user space and you usually install them or either they're already provided when you buy your computer, such as your browser. You have plenty of them for your emails, for web and so on. Uh, below, you have two layers with each uh, program. So those are provided by your operating system. So they are already installed with Windows, Linux, Mac OS, and so on. And this is where you're going to find protocols such as TCP or IP. So for this layer, you can see that you have two choices. We will see the reason you don't, you don't only have one, but you have two of them. I will explain that later. So, but those are inside your operating system. So they are provided by the operating system. And then at the link layer, what we call the link layer, it will depend on the type of interface. So here, what do you have? You have basically your drivers that you need to install. And there you have the hardware. So you have hardware that you need to fix on your computer plus the drivers. All right? And those also are installed in your operating system. So everything is available on your computer. So what I want to say is just like there's a bunch of stuff that happened even before you start sending the bits on your network. And analyzing the network is about understanding what is exactly happening, how do you prepare the data before you can transfer them as a signal. Because once you get the signal, there's not much you can do. But in order to be able to prepare their data such as they can be transmitted as a signal, there's a lot of things happening. And each I show you here the many layers that you need to go through, right? And the purpose of the, the class here of this course is to understand what is happening at the application layer to your browser, for instance. Then you move through the two next layers before you arrive at the link layer, right? And we're going to analyze each other, okay? One of the things that are important, so now if we complete the pictures, so on the side of the sender, you see that you divide your file in pieces. You add headers each time you go through one of the programs. You have a signal in the middle. So this is like you transfer through the network and you arrive at the destination. And the thing's going to happen in a reverse order where you're going to remove the headers. Okay. And so because you have these kind of layers, we usually refer to network architecture as a stack. Okay. Because each of them will basically come as a layer. So each of the headers have been added, such as your browser and the web server can communicate together. And each layer will communicate with each other by adding a specific header that will allow them to, oops, it will allow them to communicate together. And here you also have a trailer, okay? So that is a complete architecture of a network architecture, all right, through layers. Once again, the message goes through each layers and way up to the other, okay? And there are some actions taken by each of the programs that you go through at the layers. One interesting thing is the fact that in order to be able to communicate, you have a protocol. So 
So it means that you have specific type of messages that should be sent or expected by your server. So you give a type to the message by adding a specific header. Okay, and that happened at each layer. Here you are. Um, so the protocol, okay, so each layer will run a specific protocol. And what do we mean by protocol? The, the protocol is basically a list of, of messages, different type of messages. And each message will consist of the header that you added plus the payload of the data. So as you may see, the payload of TCP here comes from the upper layer. And the same goes below. You can see that basically the payload of IP is a message that have been provided by TCP. And the payload of the message to which you add the header and the trailer comes from the upper layer. So it means that each time you pass the message, and it's not a different message, it's just different because you added the extra header. That's it. So you have type of messages, and for each message, you have a specific header which cont contain a list of fields, and each field carry a specific value, okay? And on top of the type of messages, you also have rules, which means that in order to be able to communicate with someone, you need to apply some specific rules, which means that what is the type of message you expect? What action should you take when you're receiving a message? Should you re return or answer with a new message? All those rules are explained by the protocol. The same way when you pick up the phone, you use the phone network, what are you supposed to say when you pick up the phone? Can you say bye-bye? No, you need to say hello or hello in French or away in Chinese, right? Because the protocol is saying that in order to start communicating through the telephone network, you need to apply this protocol. It doesn't bring any meaning to your conversation, right? Saying hello doesn't mean anything much. The payload is the content of the message, okay? The payload is whatever is on top of the header. So you have the header plus the payload. So it's just like, you know, when you have a truck, the truck itself will carry a payload, which is the goods that you have in the payload. For a bus, the payload are the travelers, right? The people commuting. Anyway, uh, what is a driver? The only step that adds a trailer? Yes, it is. Absolutely, uh, Douglas. It is the only, only, only space where you also put a trailer. So that's specific to that layer. Okay, so examples of protocols, all right? So let, let's see what do we need a protocol and how it can be used. So for instance, let's say you have a message and that could be implemented at any layer. So let's take one layer and see if you need to achieve a property, how can you implement this property or guarantee the property, okay, by the protocol that you're using. So let's say you have a data message. In order to be able to detect the loss, what you're going to expect is you're going to send say to the receiver, okay, I'm sending you data. In order to make sure that actually you received it, what you expect in return, an acknowledgement. So you're going to have a specific message to acknowledge that, okay, these data have been received. Which means that now, since you have a loss here, you won't receive the acknowledgement. And by not receiving the acknowledgement, you may need to retransmit the data in order to repair the loss. So you see, so how to make it reliable? Anytime you send a data, you start a timer. If by the time that the timer expires, you don't receive an acknowledgement, you will say, oh, it's been lost. Let me resend it again. Pretty simple. So you see, so the protocol is a state, which is a timer, because it's a variable with a, a, a while where you decrement that value. And What's going to interrupt this while is an acknowledgement. But the acknowledgement is no data. So it means that you introduce a new type of message, which is empty, no payload at all, because there's no data. It's just for the purpose of saying, OK, I received it. OK? So two things. So the protocol here, to be reliable, need to introduce a specific message receive the acknowledgement, the green one, plus a timer. And that's it. Of course, question may arise later. How do you compute the value of the timer? What is a good value? Things like this, we're going to show them later. But it's just to show you the format here. 
you may do the same as well, not only for the losses, but you may also, you may receive it, but if you receive it and you detect a loss, uh, um, sorry, uh, L, it means that the, uh, the bits have been changed. It may happen in the network. Well, in that case, you will refrain from sending the acknowledgement just to pretend that it's been lost, even though you receive it, but it's not consistent with the data sent by the source. So you may also handle the errors here. Another thing, so for the detection, as I said, you may receive a corrupted message. So how can you check the corruption? It's very simple. You're going to add on top of your message here what we call a checksum. We call it a checksum because it's just you take your data, the bits, you add them up, you take the results of adding those bits together, the value is going to give you like a kind of a fingerprint. You do the same at the receiver. You do the sum of the bits. You compare them to the checksum that have been sent by the source. If they don't check up, if they don't match, means the data is corrupted. So if they are corrupted, I'm silent. No acknowledgement because I know that if I don't send the acknowledgement, it gonna, the timer is going to expi expire at the source and they're going to repair the loss. You see, so pretty nice protocol, very easy, simple. So you have to understand that designing protocols are not so, so complicated. Uh, the same can happen now if, for instance, you receive out of order the messages. It means that for some reason, one message arrived before the other. So you see that here, you send one, two, three, and you receive, that's a three, two, one, three. Before you reassemble the data together, you need to, back, to put them back in order. How can you do that? You add in the header a sequence number. And all you need to check is, okay, I need to put the, the packets back in order before I can reassemble. So you see, so on top of the checksum, on top of the addresses, I will add a sequence number. So those are defined by the protocol. What should I have inside the header? The same way for the post office, you need to provide the name, the first name, the address, the zip code, the country, and those information are defined by the post office. Here, when you have a protocol, they are pretty specific on what is the data expected. So the source should know about it and the destination should know about it. In order to be able to communicate, they need to apply the same standard, right? They need to understand the same protocol. So when you define the protocol, you don't really give the code or the implementation of the protocol. You just describe them in plain English and you say what are the things that should be defined. So the way they are implemented, we don't really care. All right, they could be written in C, in Java, whatever, because the message at the end is just bits. So generating bits can be done by any program. Okay, so that's why we specify here a protocol in a totally generic way. Okay, and you can read them online. They are available. They are open access. Okay. Um, and the same goes with the acknowledgements here, okay? So you may see that you may receive acknowledgements in, um, in, in, uh, not in the right order, but anyway. Um, the other thing that we can do, I don't want to get into too many details, but because those, we're going to study them later. So I'm just running out of time. So uh, the flow control, we're going to discuss in, in the next lecture, and you don't need it for the assignment. I will explain more in details later. So let's go through a few of the things that are very important for the assignment. So as I said, we need to divide the data in multiple pieces. What's going to define the right size for the piece is the fact that, as you may see, one piece at the end need to match the size of the last message. A last message is usually we, we give them specific names. So when you take the data and you add a header, the first header here, you call it a segment. When you take the segment and you add the, pack, the, the header here, you call it a packet. So a packet include a segment, right? And when the packet, you add the header and the trailer at the driver, you have what we call a frame. So be careful, inside the frame, you have a packet. Inside the packet, you have a segment. Inside the segment, you have the message from the application, all right? So those are not different messages. It's just the naming that changed, all right? So when you want to define what is the right size, what you need to know is a frame have a maximal size. So it means that you cannot send very big frames. The driver will tell you that I can only send 15, for instance, 1,500 bytes. So which means that knowing how many bytes you can put inside the frame, you may want to divide it here at this level, such as they will match with the size of the frame. So either you do that at the HTTP layer, or you may do it later, fragment later. 
So depending on the, so in the assignment, I will go through two examples where either you fragment at the TCP level, you put pieces, or at the IP level. So there are multiple choices where actually you need to match this constraint here given by the message, all right? But that makes sense, right? So it means that at the end, the message cannot be of any length. All right, so at each level, I have some specific uh, IDs to know who is the source and the destination, and each layer has their own ID. Uh, for TCP UDP, you have what we call the port number. For IP, you have the IP addresses. For what we call the link layer, we have the MAC addresses. So each of them comes with a specific ID. Okay, so when you send your message, you need to put your own ID inside the header. And it's really important to be able here to name, use your own naming standard. So it means that the driver doesn't understand IP addresses. You as well as a user, do I ask you to put the IP address? No, at the user level, I'm using URLs, right? But even if you're using your URL, at some point, you need to convert that name to an IP address. And for those who knows, the, the URL get to be an IP address by the use of DNS. Have you heard of DNS? Maybe some of you, but that's the purpose here. You let the user use very simple names to understand without asking them to learn by heart the IP address. All right. Okay, so what do we have uh, else here? Nothing more. I don't know why I added here. Um, so what you need to understand is, as I said, each layer will add a new header. So what I mean is at the link layer, I have the frame, but the frame is nothing more than the packet to which you add a packet, to which you add the header plus the trailer. Inside the packet, you have a segment, and inside the segment, you have the message of the data. And adding those headers, you will see that, okay, so here I have the data, which can be a piece of a page, web page or the piece of a picture. And on top of this, we added one header, a second header, and the, the third header, giving that you also have a trailer. Okay. And this is where you're gonna have a bunch of the information that we talked about, including the addresses. So as I said, for the frames, we have what we call the MAC addresses. So your computer have a MAC address. If you go on your, your smartphone and you check, you will have one MAC address for 4G, one MAC address for Wi-Fi, one MAC address for Bluetooth, all right? So if you check on your phone in the settings, you may see all the MAC addresses that are used. You also have an IP address. The IP address is provided by your ISP. So whenever you need to connect to the internet, it's just like your SIM card. The SIM card is just about giving you a phone number. In the internet, it's the same. In order to be able to send data or receive data, you need to have an IP address. The same way you have a phone number. So here the IP address is the same. And you learn your IP address through your ISP, your service provider, okay? So it's not provided on a SIM card, such as your phone number. Here you just learn by contacting your box or your Wi-Fi uh, at home or on the campus. Then we have port numbers, and the port numbers, this is because you may run multiple applications. So you have a port number for your browser, you have a port number for your mail. So those are kind of ID for each of the process that are running on your network, on your computer, which is an application. So which means that now when you receive a message, they could be depending on each of the data, as I said. So here you may have multiple applications. So HTTP is a web. EMAP is the mail, so you have a specific protocol for each of those applications. And you need to be able, when you receive the data, to know, okay, so who is expecting this data? Well, to know who, you name them by a number, and those are the port numbers, okay? And they are pretty standard, so they are being already by convention. The web is 80, okay? So whenever you receive some data, you know exactly that it goes for the web. So at each layer, what I try to show you here, is we may have multiple protocols running. And in order to be able to demultiplex the message, you need to check some specific value inside the header that will tell you what is the next layer. 
so when you receive the message okay so we're going to get into those details of each of the protocols uh, okay finally uh, i wanted just to show you uh, a network architecture and maybe have some keywords that you already heard in the past so we're going to start with local networks uh, local networks are just local means like on the campus we only have local networks or at home you have also what we call a local network so it means that the distance they cover is very small and you have a limit on the number of stations or hosts that you can have here and to interconnect the computers together and host that's how we call them in a network the the we have multiple type of devices so we may have hubs or we may have switches okay so those are standard uh, devices that are here to interconnect together uh, the end host and to let them communicate together so what i mean by that is like not everybody can be connected to the same wire so you need to interconnect multiple wires together in order to cover uh, some distance Okay, so as you may see, you are limited in the distance because you have a hundred meter each time, and you cannot have too many switches altogether. But which means that now, in order to communicate, you will need to go through this path to reach another host. So it's pretty simple. Uh, we will see that there is a difference between having a hub. So when you have a hub, you basically need to have a sequence of links connected together. Or when you have a switch, those are stars, giving that you can combine multiple stars together by connecting them by switches. Okay, So those are the two standard architectures that we have in local networks. So this may be, for instance, an IT room on the campus. And from one room to another, you are connected through the use of a switch. So you connect to uh, the next room by having switches on the same floor. OK, understood? So one room is a collection of computers. There's a single wire that goes to the switch. And usually if you go in an IT room, you always have like a box somewhere where you can see a device with a bunch of wires arriving. Those wires are the wires that you use in order to connect your laptop in the IT room, okay? And from that switch, you connect to another switch, such as you can reach other rooms on the same floor. So those give you a local network. So what, what I wanted to show you here, and I'm not going to run the animation, is the fact that, of course, the internet is not limited to a campus okay, or to a company. And usually what you can see is the fact that you need to interconnect together multiple devices which can be very far away from each other. And so either you connect those end holes by using super long wires, but you need too many of them. Or what we do usually instead of this, we're going to remove those links in the middle and we're going to put what we call routers. So which means that now we have the edge of the network where you find the local network. So each of them here can be combined in a local area network, okay? Using switches or hubs. But now when you reach, when you're outside of the campus, in order to connect to another part of the network, you're going to go through the backbone or the core network where you find what we call routers and so it means that even at home okay if you are in your in the dorms for instance you usually need to connect to the router of your service provider and who then connect you to the internet so basically the routers they help into having less wires because you may see that inside the core network here you don't need to uh, have a mesh network, so you may interconnect the routers together. But as you may see, you may capitalize on a single router to access the internet. So you scale down the architecture by having a two-level architecture. On the top level, you have all your routers of the backbone to which each of the clients going to connect. But you don't need to have one router per host, per commuter. You only have one router for a bunch of people living in the same area. So it's not even a building, it's for the whole precinct or arrondissement in Paris or uh, district in Shanghai that connects to one router that is installed somewhere in the city. So there are multiple point of presences 
And those routers connect you to the rest of the internet. And so this is how you can basically travel, have your data traveling across long distances, okay, by using this core network consisting of the routers. So now we have two types of devices. We have the end host, run the application. And in the middle, you have the routers. In the LAN, in the local network, you can, if you have too many devices, you can use switches to interconnect them together. Okay, we already seen this in the previous slide. But what is exactly doing a router? So now we have a problem, and the problem that we have is the following. So it means that now you have some data that arrives. And you may see that if you want to reach a destination, one of the problems that we have is there are multiple routes available. And the internet, you can only use one route. So it means that for one destination, the routers are in charge here of selecting one of the routes available. And that's what they do by doing routing. So routing is computing a path, which is actually selecting out, out of all the possible routes available. And we need many of them just in order to make it more robust. Because if a link is down, I can compute a new path and use another path, select another path. All right. So this is exactly what the routers are doing. They're computing the path because they need to select one. And so usually, what is the what is the kind of what is the kind of of uh, selection criteria that I'm using? Fine. So it could be the number of routers one, two, three that give me the number of hops, right? One hop, two hops, three hops, and I'm going to minimize the number of hops. Could be the distance, like how many meters away. You know, somebody said, Isabella said the congestion, which is a very good answer, but congestion is really hard to measure. So, and you see that here, I, I show you a small network, but you need to understand that you have hundreds of thousands of routers and they need to do the computation, which can be NP hard, given the size of the network. So usually, yes, there's a bunch of stuff that we can do that are very complex, but because of the scale of the network, we always gonna try to scale down the problem by making very simple choices. So yeah, most of the time could be the number of hops, could be the distance, and sometimes it also comes down to money because this is not only run by a single company. Actually, there are multiple, I didn't show it here, I'm sorry. Actually, there are multiple ISPs and they are all connected together. In, the, in North America, I have a bunch of ISPs. In Europe, I have others. In China, I have others. And so it means that actually your packets will follow multiple networks that somebody else is running. And those people, they will let you access the network by paying money, okay? It's the same way when you fly with an airplane on top of a country, sometimes you need to pay a tax because you are using the air above that country. The same goes in the network. So sometimes you have multiple choices. Okay, should I use AT&T? Should I use Sprint? Should I use China Unicom? That comes with the price and they try to minimize the price that actually going to be charged because you're trying to download the file. Of course, it doesn't show at your level, but your own ISP you're using at home will make that kind of choice and do some agreements that actually I'm not going to go this way, even though it's shortest, but I'm going to go this way because it's, it's cheaper. Anyway. So as you may see, so two, two types of devices. So, and we have the routers. So the routers are in charge of checking the destination IP address of your packet and selecting the path that should be followed. And at the end hosts, we do all the rest. So the routers have a pretty simple task, but given the scale, they need to do it really fast. So the, in the internet, a packet should spend less than 100 of nanoseconds in a router before it can get transmitted to the next one. So you need to take a timely decision and it's really fast. So you don't have time to check errors, check losses. No, if you start doing this, it's going to delay so much your packets, the user will have a very bad experience. So that's the reason routers, we keep it simple, just take the good decision regarding the routes. Anything else that needs to be done is done at the end holes. So that's the reason I'm telling you here, everything else including running the applications, browser and so on, and making sure that if there are losses and my application is not happy about it, I need to repair the losses. And I need to do to, to all those stuff by running at the end. All right. Of course, if you don't need to make it reliable, you have another service, which is UDP at the layer four, which is a transfer layer. 
So anyway, so here is now uh, the complete architecture. So we have two nodes on the end host. We have on top of whatever is already available at IP, because IP is doing the computation of the path, the forwarding of the packet along the path. And everything on top of this will bring some guarantees, like some properties to the transfer, and they are done only at the end host. So you see multiple layers, but those layers, we give them numbers as well, seven, four, three, two, one. I will explain why we skip here five and six, but you see at the router, you only have two layers, the three layers, sorry, okay? That's the way it is. And you go through those steps. All right, so you have, you have different tasks that need to be completed. So as I said, the network is in charge of forwarding or routing packets across multiple routers. The transport layer is here to make sure that the transfer is reliable. The application, this is what is the interface to the users. So depending on the type of services that you want, do you want to browse the web, do you want to talk to someone on WeChat. And the link layer is basically the transfer between two network devices. So it means we already said that as a client, you may go through a switch who is connected to a router, to another router, to another router, and then to the switch on the local network of the destination. So to decide what is the path, it's the IP layer that will decide about the path, but actually sending hop by hop the data, this is a link layer that will basically bring some properties for this. But we're gonna get into the details of those lower, lower levels uh, later, no problem. So we're gonna start with the application on Wednesday with HTTP, okay? So this is the course content. So we're gonna go through all those protocols, starting from the bottom, from the top, sorry, and reaching the bottom. So next lecture is about HTTP, okay? We're gonna try to understand how is HTTP working.